this is editing Jackson just coming in for a second, just letting you guys know that there's actually six teams we chose not to talk about just because they hadn't done too much so far this offseason. That was the New York Jets, the Chiefs, the Steelers, the Redskins, Rams, and Seahawks. So just so you guys know why we didn't talk about those teams, that's going to be why. Also, one other thing is that we have this podcast available for download only. So if you want to download this on your phone or just play it on your phone or on your computer or whatever, you can listen to the audio only file. If you go to the link in the description below, you can listen to all our uh, podcasts, both of them. So feel free to do that. And also, we did have a little bit of audio problems early on. It just it doesn't sound great at first, but it does get better a little bit later on. So, uh, you know, try to bear with us through that part. But anyways, hope you guys enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the still unnamed Jackson and Kyle podcast. Kyle, I had an idea that I should come up with some ideas of great podcast oh. names and give them to you on the air. See what you think about. It. How does that sound? That sounds great. It does, but I did not actually come up with any ideas, so uh, the maybe for another time. But until then, we still have the unnamed Jackson podcast. Podcast, and uh, honestly, I feel like sometimes you just get a gift from the gods. One, we've been doing this for now two podcasts, and already the biggest story, you know, that probably will be the biggest story of the year, happens to involve our two favorite teams, Tom Brady leaving the Patriots. Going to the Buccaneers. I figured we'll start here and then get into our breakdowns of individual teams. Uh, just, I mean, you're a Patriots fans. What are your initial? You're a Patriots fan. What is your initial thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, internally crying. No, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a lot to unpack with this one. It was a, you know, it makes a lot of sense for Brady and his perspective. He's going to go to a team where he's going to throw to two of the best ten receivers in football essentially. And at that point, if you're going to have that kind of weaponry to uh, throw to, why do you not take this deal? Um, I think there are going to be some things that they're going to have to adjust. I think the whole thing about the the Patriots only dink and dunk and, uh, you know, they act like the Patriots only throw to five yard passes and the Buccaneers only throw 50 yard passes, which is kind of blown out of proportion. I think the, um, you know, the, Buccaneers, I think I saw, were the best team from 10 to 20 yards uh, passing last season. And that's where Brady is typically the best quarterback in football. Um, the only difference is to me is that a lot of what the Buccaneers do is they run deep routes to open up the 15 to 20 yard routes, whereas the Patriots run short routes and try to hit you over the top with those 15 to 20 yard routes. So I think it's going to be a lot of schematic changes that are going to have more crossing routes. But, you know, you got size in Godwin, you got size in Evans. If they bring back Perriman, that's another guy with a lot of size too. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity here for Brady. The big thing, I think the Buccaneers have done everything really well so far is obviously you talked about it on the last show. Uh, the offensive tackle help is going to be necessary. Um, there's still some, you know, they can get a veteran like a Jason Peters, Andrew Whitworth, who's a little up there in age, but still a pretty good pass blocker at the tackle position and yeah, still uh, draft a guy like just not to interrupt, Andrew Whitworth did get re-signed to a three-year deal by the Rams. So, Oh, did he get re-signed? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But a guy like Jason Peters is still available. And then um, who's the other? And then they can draft a guy like Tristan Wirfs also to, like, wait in the wings of Jarek Willis or whatever. Um, you know, that's definitely the option they're going to have to go. But a lot of positive movement so far for what the Buccaneers have done this offseason. Yeah. I mean, it's. Again, the tackle position, that's something that definitely has to be brought up. I do think going like uh, drafting one seems to make the most sense. Uh, that's where I'm at, and I feel like we can, uh, you know, I think the receiving position is clearly uh, two guys that I'm a homer, but I would say are the top, are both in the top five right now, with how good they played last season. And on top of all this, 10. I think that, at least top 10. Yeah. Uh, again, again, it could be debated, but yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, here's my thought with this is that there's a lot of things that can't go wrong. Brady is going to be 43 next year. There's a lot of things that are worrying in a sense, but I'm just going to let myself get excited about this decision about bringing in Tom Brady. And you know what? Sports are about fun at the end of the day. And it's, there's really no more fun move than bringing on a six time Super Bowl champion onto your team. Uh, I don't know if it's going to work. I, like I do. I said I wanted to keep Jameis at the time, but 
again, it's just like we have an actual chance to win the Super Bowl right now, which is not something I would have said before this signing. Like, I'm not saying it's I'm not saying we're like the favorites or anything, but there is a chance there. People are talking about it. I think that we still have some problems, but I do think that having a quarterback who isn't going to throw 30 interceptions will help. Now, I want to transition a little bit, just a little bit, uh, to now it looks like the Patriots are going to be starting Jarrett Stidham. I was very high on him coming out of the draft. I thought it was a great decision by the Patriots to draft him in a late round. Kyle, what are your thoughts about them moving forward with Stidham? Um, well, I mean, I don't know how I feel about Stidham per se. I, don't, I think that Auburn offense isn't really translatable to the NFL. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Obviously, there's a lot of reports at a camp that they're really high on him. Um, I'm not necessarily sure I believe that because, I mean, they were high on Ryan Mallett. Uh, I think that a lot of it is like just trade chip kind of pieces. But the one thing that I do think that they're going to constantly bring in a quarterback until they find the next franchise guy. You know, Belichick's not going to be the guy to wait around. You know, there's going to be opportunities for, you know, you're going to pay really cheap for a guy like Andy Dalton, potentially a guy like Cam Newton, potentially you can get at a really cheap price. I'm not sure Stidham's going to be the guy to start going into the next season, but I mean, right now he's there and we'll see what happens, but there's plenty of options to bring in. Um, I guess overall, if I were to grade the Patriots free agency, I would still kind of put it as a to be determined um, because, you know, if any, if any player actually, if any team actually thrives in week, week two of free agency, it's the New England Patriots. You know, this is the team mm-hmm. that always brings in the value players in that second week when everyone's value is really low. And there's going to be opportunities, you know, guys like Brashard Perriman, Robbie Anderson, all these guys are still unsigned. And they're going to be able to maybe try and grab a couple of these guys, open up some cap space and get some of these guys. Um, but I'm not necessarily going to say that we're going to be successful without Tom Brady because I, I don't really believe in the notion that uh, the system is good enough to withstand without Tom Brady. Um, you know, everyone points to that 11 and five season with Matt Castle, but they're 18 and one the year before. So that means he was seven wins worse than what Tom Brady was. Uh, they played the, I believe it was the NFC West and the AFC West that year in 2008. And I think it was that year that the NFC West and AFC West had no teams over 500. All eight teams were all under okay. 500. Gotcha. So, you know, that 11 and five season was kind of a fluke and also something that probably isn't like true to how good that team actually was. And like I said, that team was undefeated the year before and lost five wins off of it. So I think Brady is still the greatest quarterback of all time. And that's going to be really hard to replicate. Uh, We'll see what happens. Let's see. We'll, we'll see who they bring in as a franchise guy. I kind of rambled on that one, but you know, it's okay. No, I think uh, actually, could you go five more minutes on the Patriots 2008 season? I think that we, uh, no. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no. Uh, listen, and I also feel like there's something like weird about like I don't consider myself like a Pete, uh, Brady fan or a Brady hater. I've always kind of sat in the middle. Uh, I've uh, including the Patriots. I never really hated them. I've always kind of had the mindset of. Hey, they beat the Saints. They beat the, or they didn't beat the Saints, but they beat the Falcons and they beat the Panthers. Uh, and so why would I complain about them? They've helped my team out. Uh, but at the same time, I have also, like, I can't backtrack and pretend like I haven't said things. Like, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and definitively say he's the greatest of all time. Uh, I think that there's other guys you could make the argument, not to saying that they are better, but I just, I kind of hate the absolute that gets brought in with Brady. Like, Dan Marino threw for 48 touchdowns and 5,000 yards in 1984. So I think there's some things you could talk about. But again, it's just like he's such an icon in the New England Patriots to leave. It, it's it's an, at the end of an era. And Kyle, I know you're a Patriots fan. Also, the hook cam who makes videos on here on Jackson Kruger Sports, he's a big Patriots fan. Uh there is something about a neutral fan that kind of wants to see the New England Patriots crash and burn. I think that just <laughs> for all of the young Patriots fans that don't know what it's like to have to sit around for, I mean, we've, the Bucks have never had a quarterback. So it's, there's kind of just that, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, it is going to be a rebuilding project. I'm not going to say we're going to be competing for Super Bowls for the next 10 years mm-hmm. uh, with or without Brady. I think we have an infrastructure that we can actually rebuild rather quickly and still be a competitive football team. 
I think people writing us off as probably a six or seven or eight win team this year. I don't think our, uh, you know, looking at everything that the Patriots have, we still have one of the best defenses in football. You know, people are saying that we want to tank for Trevor Lawrence. I don't necessarily agree that that's ever going to happen. Um, so I think the Patriots are going to be fine. I think Brady is also going to be fine. And, you know, sad, you know, take a logical approach to this. Both got both the Brady, Brady and the Patriots are really good and both are going to be perfectly fine going forward. Yeah. I mean, that is like, I, I think the, the death of the Patriots has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, their offense wasn't what won them games last year. I think they're definitely still a playoff team in my mind. But let's now, uh, again, slight transition here. You said that you thought that this free agency is to be determined. I kind of feel like this has been a, a pretty bad free agency for New England. I feel like they've lost a laundry list full of players. Uh, definitely from a you know just like a an emotional standpoint, I'm sure Patriots fans are devastated. But also, I mean, I'm just going to list it off here. They've lost. They tagged Joe Thune and they re-signed Devin McCourtney. But they lost Tom Brady, Jamie Collins, Kyle Van Noy, Danny Shelton, Deron Harmon, and Ted Carreras. I mean, they've lost like a quarter of their team. Well, so, I mean, Karras was not in line to start because David Andrews was coming back. Uh, sure. You know, I, I didn't think Danny Shelton, I thought he was fine, but overall Adam Butler was the better defensive tackle anyway and getting more of the reps. If they can mm -hmm. bring Adam Butler back, that's a, probably a better option. Um, Van Noy, I, I mean, I'm a huge Kyle Van Noy fan, and Belichick's been a huge fan of his for a lot of years. Basically for his high IQ, you know, he doesn't do anything that wows you, but he just makes a lot of really smart football plays. And the issue is going to be uh, replicating that that ability on the field. But overall, I mean, $30 million guaranteed, like, I don't know. The Patriots were never going to pay $30 million guaranteed. And Jamie Collins, you know, we got set for essentially nothing. And I don't think anyone was really hyping him as a big free agent signing or a uh, big signing last offseason. Off and now it's a big deal that he's gone. I think that play that position's replicable. And no, uh, I, you know, oh, I was gonna say no. I think that you. Uh, I think that like it, from the sense of like I understand why I didn't stick with any of these select guys, but at the same time, I do kind of feel like you're losing two linebackers who were very good for you last year. Two, uh, and you know you're losing your quarterback. And the only thing you did was re-sign a couple of guys. I don't see how this. I don't think it's necessarily a disaster. Like I said, no team is better at finding guys that nobody thought would be good and then turning them into studs. So the jury is still out in the sense of, I still think they can be good, but in terms of just what we've seen so far, I do feel like this has to be, if we're saying either win or loss, I feel like it has to be a loss. That's fair. We could put it at a loss for now. I mean, the thing is, is like, if they, if they get a couple good linebackers for really cheap this next week, and if they get maybe, you know, I, I do think the secondary needs to get a little younger, and that's probably what they'll address in the draft in the first round because we rarely take skill position guys in the first round, and I can't see us doing it for, what, three straight years now? Um, kind so, of, yeah, because they also yeah, drafted so, the tackle. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. Isaiah Wynn and Sony Michelle that year, and then Nikhil Harry this past season. Right. Um, I don't see us taking another receiver in the first round. And I think that's going to be kind of like a Xavier McKinney kind of um, spot. But overall, if they get a couple good linebackers, this this defense is still going to be pretty pretty good this next year. I would still say it's probably top ten in the league. Um, so I'm I'm not overly worried about the defense overall. And you know, just off of being healthier, the and you know, Muhammad Sunu is going to get another year in the system. Nikhil Harry is going to be healthy, hopefully out of the gate. You know, this offense. Not because of Brady's fault, this offense might actually be better because James Devlin's going to be back, David Andrews is going to be back, Isaiah Wynn's going to be healthy. Those receivers I listed, you know, uh, this this offense could be better even without Brady because our offense wasn't very good last year, and I don't think it was Brady's fault that we were bad last year. So I think there's plenty of opportunities for this team to be really good again next year and still be 10, 11 wins. Yeah, no, I. I I don't actually disagree with any of that. I think the real reason that the Patriots struggled last year was because of injuries. Like, I think that the best thing to happen to them going into 2020 is just being healthy. So uh, I think that we've, uh, you know, uh, I think we'll, we can adjust here. We can go on to, let's go just to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This has to be just an obvious win, right? Yeah, I mean, this is an A to me. We talked about last week that, 
the franchise tag is kind of built for a guy like Shaq Barrett because, you know, you got to make sure he proves it another year before you're willing to shell out all the cash. So this is a prove-it year for Shaq Barrett. And, you know, that defensive line, that defensive front's going to be pretty good for them. Um, I, I really like – I think I saw Pro Football Focus had them as the 11th the 11th ranked team despite, um, you know, despite the 7-9 and nine record. And I think a lot of that had to do with, A, their offense turned the ball over a lot, and, B, that secondary was – borderline atrocious up until like halfway through the season they got pretty much they got a lot better so mm-hmm. i think that te- that's a big win for this team i think that secondary really improved and they're going to be pretty good uh you know at the very least brady you know winston had more interceptions last year than brady had in four seasons the last four right. seasons combined so i think uh you know having having brady in that position at least you're taking care of the ball at the very minimum and you know mm-hmm. that interior line's pretty good there's a lot of people talking about they need a running back. I didn't hate Ronald Jones. Um, I think he's fine. I think they're going to need a guy who's better in pass protection uh, as like the secondary back, like Chris Thompson type maybe. But overall, I think it was pretty fine uh, having him there with those weapons at receiver. This is a big win for the Buccaneers. Yeah, and you know another thing, they re-signed Jason Pierre-Paul, who when he came back, after I believe it was after week eight, it was around there, uh, They that was also – just around a time when their defense really improved. It was also when they ditched Vernon Hargraves and let uh, Jamal Dean become their starter, and he really thrived. So, yeah, again, it's kind of just a lot of it is just young players getting better. But in terms of just the free agency, they did lose Carl Nassib, who I do think will hurt. He was a great rotational player. But as a whole, I mean, getting a new quarterback and then re-signing a couple of really good pass rushers, it's just – it's a – it's a win for me. I am doing what I do every offseason and getting way too optimistic over my team, and I'm sure it will result in disappointment, <laughs> as it usually does. But you know what? I'm a Buccaneers fan, and I'm used to it. So from there, I want to get into the the big trade of today, and that was uh, Darius Slay getting traded from the Lions to the Eagles. They also gave him a big con- – Philadelphia also gave him a big contract when he went there. I mean, overall, I think this is kind of, you know, depending on how you feel about Darius Slay overall, I think he's a pretty solid cornerback. Pretty what great are your thoughts skills. about this? Um, I think this is kind of a win for uh, the Eagles because, uh, you know, they, you know, third and fifth round pick is not that much capital for the Eagles. And this is kind of something that they've missed for, I, I feel like, two years now. That number one secure cornerback that they feel like they can have. Uh, they can rely on is something that they've missed for a long time. And now they finally get that position player that they need. This Eagles team is going to be pretty good next year, as long as they stay healthy, which is a big gift with the guys like Carson Wentz and, you know, a lot of the players on that roster. And I feel like they had a pretty, uh, I feel like that's a pretty good trade for them. Yeah, I'm with you. I like this from Philadelphia's perspective and I'll get a bit more into it. I'm going to make a a video about this coming out soon. Uh, So be on the lookout for that. But I want to actually take this from the flip side now. Let's talk about this from the Lions' perspective. How do you feel about Detroit and just all of the moves they've done in general? You know, overall, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of teams that try and replicate what the Patriots do. Um, and I guess I'll get in this, into this a little bit too with the, uh, with the Dolphins also because it's really hard to replicate what New England does as a whole. But overall, I really like um, – I'm not really disappointed with what the uh, Lions did. Because the Lions, you know, have a lot of cheap contracts. So they didn't put a lot of money into these guys. You know, these aren't like big spending uh, free agents. So I'm pretty happy with a lot, a lot of what the Lions did. And they, you know, I do think they're going to get better on defense with a lot of these options. Yeah, uh, I missed a little bit of that, but I, I think I got most of it. Um, so here's my thing with the Lions. I just, I don't trust Matt Patricia, quite frankly. I think that Matt well, Patricia yeah. is probably, I mean, I'll say he's the worst coach in the NFL. I don't know what Detroit is doing, giving him a third season. And when I was looking at a guy like Darius Slay, I'm going to make a video on it later today, uh, but I'm, I was just watching so much tape of him, and it, it seems like so many times he was just put in a position to fail. And I think a lot of it, the reason why you see that, you know, he had – so like I was looking at his PFF grades, I believe it was like 56 last year and it was like 75 plus every year prior. And one of the reasons for the drop off is just because he's been put out of position. You know, you ha- have a team that for some reason thinks that three man rushes work consistently when th- they don't. Uh, I think that he's 
consistently put out of position, consistently put in a position to fail. And I think that if we're doing winners and losers, I think Slay is the real winner here, going to a system yeah. that'll fit him better, getting paid a- along with it. Uh, I just feel like he's been more of a more of a loss. You know, his failure to play as well seems to me more on Patricia. It's like it'd be like if you got if you inherited a hundred thousand dollar car and didn't realize what was so cool about it, so you sold it for fifty thousand. Like I, I just feel like yeah. this is. It's it's just Patricia not knowing what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I mean, so a lot of the things I was going to say is I I like what the Lions did overall, but I hate their coaching infrastructure where I like a lot of what Miami's doing in their infrastructure going forward, and I like Flores a lot as a coach, but I hate a lot of the moves they did because they committed so much money to a lot of positions. Um, But overall, I feel like the Lions, you know, yeah, I don't think Patricia is a very good coach, and I don't think this team's going to be very good. But like I said, it's not a lot of money going towards these guys, and it's very clear that if Darius Slay isn't going to be, you know, the player you want to fit that system, then then find a guy who's going to fit the system. You could argue whether you know Slay. You could argue whether the uh, it was the coach's fault that he's not fitting the system. But overall, if he's not fitting the system, you got to find someone to get him. And it's just a question on what the if the value for that was fair. Yeah, and you know, uh, one thing I got to give a shout out to Luke G's field review. He does a great job with Detroit, but, uh, you know, he talks about a bunch of Lions stuff. He does a great job there. But one thing that I also feel like is that this Jamie Collins signing is totally set up to just be a repeat of Jamie Collins in Cleveland, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, overall, I don't think he's going to be very good outside of that New England system. Um, You know, that requires a lot of discipline. Um, But, you know, it's $18 million guaranteed at the end of the day. You know, are you really like getting strangled because of eighteen million dollars guaranteed? I think that's a pretty good value play for what they are uh, looking for, and I, I don't hate the move honestly. I think uh, Collins is still a freak athlete and he's going to be able to make some big plays for a team. It just depends on if you can get him disciplined enough to uh, stay in the system, and we'll see how long Patricia lasts in Detroit before we, uh, you know, grade this free agent uh, class. That's fair. You're probably being more fair about this than I am, actually, uh, after having this discussion. But part of what I'm frustrated, and this is unfair, but I fell in love with the Lions last year. I said, here, they're making all the right moves, and then they completely blew it. Uh, And I just, I I just mean that it's going to happen again. But anyways, I think you make some fair points. Uh, And so let's move on to a team that nobody would consider a loss, and that's the Houston Texans. I mean, oh, getting geez. that second-round pick, just a great value there. Also, <laughs> re-signed Vernon Hargraves, so got that. Uh, they added uh, Bradley Roby, Bradley Roby, excuse me, uh, and then just lost, like, DJ Reader and DeAndre Hopkins. But, you know, that's pretty solid uh, free agency. Yeah, they're on fire right now. I mean, overall, uh-huh. like... Listen, this is a this is a special case, obviously, because the whole owner situation. Um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but he passed away, and then having no GM in the facility right now. Obviously, that that is a special situation. But what, what I hope we learn from this whole entire thing is that a coach should never be a GM ever again. Like I hope that entire infrastructure that a coach right. GM role happens just never happens again, because this guy. Bill O'Brien was on the cups of getting fired last year and probably still should have been fired after that Bills game for how badly that went. And now he's back and just completely vindictive over all these players that, you know, realize he's a bad coach, but he's still on the staff. And I just don't understand the move. David Johnson would have had to have a pick attached to him for any other team to take his contract. And you're giving away your best player to take him in a fourth round pick plus or a second round pick, excuse me, plus giving a fourth round pick. I just don't understand the move whatsoever. You're giving away your best football player for a guy who's a mediocre running back on a $13 million salary. And, you know, DJ Reader's another one where, you know, I don't know if he's worth the $53 million he was given, but at the same time, you know, that's a huge vil- void you have to fill now that you don't have any option for. You know, I, I don't think Bill O'Brien understands value for players at all. Because what yeah. Bill O'Brien, <laughs> he just the, the, the best part about all of this, too, is, I mean, all of it's pretty comical to watch. And I, if you're a Texans fan, I'm sorry. 
but oh that's the worst yeah but <laughs> yeah. worse than coronavirus at this point if you're a texans yeah fan, i mean between the astro stuff the rocket small ball and texans oh. you know it's a it's hey, a rough time Jerry, for houston it's small ball okay but oh geez um but where was i um wow I lost I don't my train know. of thought there for a second. I don't but, we're saying oh, the value so, too much. <laughs> very so, how bad Bill O'Brien is. The the best part about all this though, I remember where I was. That uh, you know, just last year he traded I think two first round picks for Laramie Tunzel and Kenny Stills, mm-hmm. and then he's getting a he's getting a second round pick in David Johnson for DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah. Like I just don't get it. What is he What is he seeing from these guys that it's like, oh yeah, this makes sense? Where did he get the book that this makes sense at all? Yeah, I don't you know. I've been someone who's defended some of Bill O'Brien's moves over the years. I thought that the Tunsil was an overpay, but I also thought that it listen, it gave them a great left tackle. They also drafted Titus Howard, so now all of a sudden they had a good tackle p- situation when in the past they had a terrible one. Uh, also, I just looked it up. Uh, Bob McNair, the owner, former owner of the Texans before passing away. But, but yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like even the arguments you want to make for it, let's say, you know. Like sort of like if you want to say, well, they didn't have the great great chemistry. He didn't like the locker room presence. He felt like he was overvalued. All of that is fine. Like I have no problem with you trading away a great receiver. My problem with it is trading away a great receiver for an uh, old running back and a second round pick. I mean, it just it makes no sense to me. Uh, but let's talk about it from the Cardinals perspective. I mean, this is just a massive win, right? Yeah, I mean, this is as good as it gets. You you got an insane re- receiving core now. With uh, I still like Christian Kirk a lot. Um, you know, his numbers haven't been what I was really hoping for. That he takes that mantle from Larry Fitzgerald, but he's been really he he was pretty good last year in um, uh, you know, in limited spurts. And I think him and Fitzgerald and uh, Hopkins are going to be a productive team. And not only that, but you know, Kenyon Drake was better than David Johnson for most of the year, and they bring back Kenyon Drake for essentially nothing. Um, and then they, um, you know, they, they let Johnson go. They get out of his contract. That's an amazing win for the uh, Cardinals. Yeah. It's truly incredible. I mean, I was thinking that I don't know if Arizona can get rid of the David Johnson contract. I was thinking that they were going to have to give up draft capital, similar to the Osweiler trade, you know, to get rid of him. (laughs) So just that alone is like, okay, big win. But then to add DeAndre Hopkins, who can now be, you know, he forget number one receiver. He might be the number one receiver in the league, and you're getting him to to pair with your young quarterback in a system that I'm imagining they'll love to figure out a way to use him. Uh, it just it makes no sense to me. I it's one of those trades. I can't remember the last time a trade has been like this where it's universally hated. Like I don't know anybody who has really come out and said I like this move from the Houston Texans perspective. Because how could you? I don't think anybody can. You know, this is exactly how the phone call went. It went like this. So he's like, this is the Cardinals GM. Hello? Oh, you want to get rid of DeAndre Hopkins for a second-round pick in David Johnson? Hold, please. He goes to the owner. Hey, this guy has no idea what he's doing. I'm going to get DeAndre Hopkins. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know about that. Can I get a fourth-round pick also? Yeah? All right, perfect. Done. All right, thanks. Yeah, uh, it's just like that's that's an amazing the fact that they got a draft pick out of this too just makes it amazing that the Cardinals, you know, the GM deserves a pay raise right now. Honestly, that's an amazing job. <laughs> yeah, it, again, the wild thing too is I almost feel like there's 31 losers to this trade because how did nobody else say, "Hey, we'll give you a first for Hopkins"? Like it just says that the Texans didn't even do their due diligence to shop him around and see what they could truly get. They wanted to trade him so quickly, and people are saying maybe he wanted a bigger contract. They didn't want to pay it. Well, you don't have to trade him today. You can trade him in a month when teams are willing to give up more. Again, it just, doesn't make sense well, to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're going to disagree on that. Uh, so let's just go ahead and move on to uh, another big move, another controversial move. Uh, this is going to be the Carolina Panthers. The controversial move was the Teddy Bridgewater signing. Some people love it. Some people hate it. They lost Gerald McCoy, James Bradbury, who's a big loss. He was a great corner to help those big NFC South receivers be stopped. Uh, They're going to lose Cam Newton. They also got John Miller, who's a fine guard. 
Uh, they re-signed Trey Boston, and they traded for Russell Okun. They got rid of Trey Turner. So, uh, Kyle, what are your thoughts on Teddy Bridgewater? Is this a good signing? Is it a bad signing? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, what's happening with Bridgewater, I mean, we'll see how he looks outside of that same system. I, You know, he had his flashes in Minnesota where Minnesota has come out and said before in the past that they were ready to make him the franchise guy up until the injuries. You know, he goes to New Orleans. He learns under uh, Sean Payton, Drew Brees. You know, that offense makes him look pretty good. And we're just going to see what happens. I don't think he's going to be like a game changer like 2015 Cam Newton was. But it was pretty clear that that offense was, you know, outside of McCaffrey. That was – and I think DJ Moore had a big year last year. Um, you know, the, for the most part, you know, the quarterback was up last year. Even with Cam Newton uh, playing, you know, he was playing hurt and it was a problem. So we'll see what happens with Bridgewater. I think it's a pretty good move overall. You know, the $20 million is the going rate for a starting quarterback in the NFL. So I think it's a pretty good value. You're only putting him on for three years. So it's not like decimating your franchise. And I think the Panthers have to realize this is kind of like a rebuild mode, you know, that they're complaining about the guys leaving and all that, but they're, they're not geared towards winning this year. This is a team that's geared towards winning in the year's future. Yeah, no, I think that I do think that they're going to try to rebuild here. Here's my thoughts on the Teddy Bridgewater thing. First, I want to separate uh, Bridgewater from the Panthers and say that I very happy for Bridgewater himself. I think it's a great story. He had that devastating injury. Who is even going to walk again? He turns out to not only be able to get back into the NFL, but sign a big contract. Just a, a great story for Bridgewater. But I'll be honest, I don't love this move. I think that, you know, you have a guy like Cam Newton who has the high ceiling but also a low floor because we don't know where his injury history is at. So instead of that, they went with the guy with the lower ceiling but also a much higher floor. So the chances of Bridgewater being bad are small. The chances of him being elite are small. He's probably going to just be good, which is fine. But I also feel like they kind of had that with Kyle Allen. I didn't think Kyle Allen... I don't think that this is a $30 million upgrade uh, for Teddy Bridgewater over Kyle Allen. I would have kind of rather just stuck with Allen and maybe drafted somebody. Yeah. I wasn't a huge fan of Kyle Allen. I thought he had some good games and some bad games. I mean, that's a rookie for you. So I guess, you know, clearly whoever was in, in-house at the time was said that it was fine and didn't like what they saw out of Allen. I don't know what Matt Rule felt like about Kyle Allen. But I just think over I, I'm with you on that because it makes sense if they're gonna rebuild, you might as well just see what you have out of the guy and then go for it. Cause I just, you know, as good as Matt as much as I like Matt Rule and as much as I like Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator, I don't think this team's gonna be good next year. Even with the guys they have the weapons they still have on offense, I just don't think this team's gonna be very good. So I'm with you on that. They'll to let the young guys see what he can do. But uh, you know. I don't think it's a very high risk with the Bridgewater deal because it's only three years. And that's yeah. a tradable contract if he still plays solid, solidly. Right. Yeah. I mean, and we just saw uh, the guy who we'll get into next, Nick Foles. Uh, he, if, you know, he got traded despite having a very poor performance in his first year of a contract. It's not impossible to move the contracts. I don't hate it. I don't think it's going to tank the Panthers. I think it's the wrong move. I don't think it's a disastrous move, is kind of where I would have it at. Yeah. I can agree with that. All right, so let's transition to the Chicago Bears, who, uh, you know, this would have been a, a great free agency, what, 10 years ago with Nick Foles and Jay Graham. Uh, they also <laughs> did add Robert Quinn to a five-year, $70 million deal, although only $30 million of it is guaranteed. They lost Nick, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. He's number 44, good player. And then they lost Chase Daniel, which is just a huge, devastating loss. But, uh, Kyle, what are your thoughts? Do you like the Nick Foles trade? Let's just start with the Nick Foles trade first. Um, not really. I mean, I, I, went, I was there last week to say that, uh, you know, I don't think any, anybody was really going to be successful in that Jacksonville situation last year. Um, but overall, I mean, how many stops is he going to get that he's going to look kind of unimpressive? But he's going to get paid and, like, signed because of these uh, – you know, because of essentially three or four games that he played really well in, and that was on the way to the Super Bowl. Obviously, you know, winning the banner was a big deal, but, you know, his stint when he actually started in uh, Philadelphia to finish that regular season, 
He wasn't good. You know, he played well in the playoffs, which was a big deal. He didn't play well in Jacksonville, and he didn't play well in St. Louis when he signed there for the big contract. So how many times is this, how many chances is he going to get overall? That's why, that's how I feel about him. Yeah. And you know, he did in his two games in Kansas city, he played solid there, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, he's pretty much relying on that one 27 and two season. And then the, it was really just two games. He was really good in, in the postseason. It was against the Vikings and against the, the Patriots, the, you know, the Falcons game, the defense mostly won it for him. But yeah. I, yeah, it's kind of one of those things where it's like you knew they had to do something. They couldn't roll out next season with Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, I, I do think that I have it as a loss for the Bears, but I do understand where they're coming from. I think there was better guys they could have gone after. I mean, they already don't have much cap space, largely. You know, when you pay a non-quarterback quarterback money with Khalil Mack, you're going to have, you know, a tight amount of cap space to spend. Not saying it's not worth it, but uh, that's just the situation. Also, the Jimmy Graham trade or uh, Jimmy Graham signing makes no sense to me whatsoever. I don't know why you're paying a, a clearly washed up tight end. I believe it's around eight million dollars. Yeah, I mean the I thing did... is, oh sorry, I was oh, no, going to say was... he. Oh, <laughs> uh, Go I was going to say he has great hands still, but I mean I watched a lot of those Packers game, and the guy just can't get open anymore. He he's just so broken down that he can't get open and obviously he's never been a blocker for a tight end i i don't get the move for jimmy graham either i don't get why people keep paying him at these eight million dollar salaries yeah yeah no i'm a few uh doesn't make a lot of sense to me either uh and then the again going back to the nick Foles thing one other thought i had is that as much as i might want to sit here because i've actually kind of been more pro nick Foles. i think that he is a solid player but he just needs the right piece of them he's one of the players who just needs good pieces of him too. But I do think that he's kind of going Jacksonville too, because the bears are very similar <laughs> to what Jacksonville was where it's be, they don't have a great offensive line. Their offensive line really deteriorated from two years ago to last year. Uh, you know, the receiving core is terrible at bills and they, they can't really run. The, they didn't run the ball well last year. So I kind of just feel like, they're, it's he's going to just go back to a very similar situation with Chicago. Yeah, I mean, I can I can understand that. I think uh, you know, obviously Kyle Long getting hurt a lot these past couple of years, and then obviously retiring is a big mm -hmm. loss for them in that offensive line. I um, I think Allen Robinson's probably better than any receiver that Jacksonville had, but at the same time, I'm not really sure without an offensive line. And, you know, with Nick Foles at quarterback, how easy it is going to be for them to get him the ball. Because, you know, that was the issue they had last year with Trubisky, too. I think that uh, I, I like a lot of what David Montgomery did. Um, but he needs to be used more, and he needs more touches overall. Um, so we'll see what happens with the Bears. I'm, not, I'm still not high on that offense. And I, it seems like they might have missed their window for that team. Yeah, I kind of wonder the same thing. Uh, it it's tough when you don't have first round picks. I mean, this is the the downside of trading multiple first round picks, uh, unless you can get like a stud like Laramie Tunsil. But if uh, but for a guy like uh, you know, when they traded it, it was a we have to win either this year or next year, and really it all comes down to. I mean, I know it's been talked to death, but the Mitchell Trubisky uh, not being able to develop. I mean, if they had the quarterback position. This is a very different team. If they had Deshaun Watson, this is a very different team. It just it didn't work out for them. Uh, I don't want to say that they're dead necessarily. I do think that Akeem Hicks getting hurt last year was a huge loss. Uh, so I do think that him coming back could be very big. But it's just tough. And so let's move on to another quarterback who has changed teams. And that is with the Indianapolis Colts. Phillip Rivers is no longer a San Diego or Los Angeles Charger uh kyle what are your thoughts on rivers being in indianapolis um you know there was a lot of talk about how far how many steps back that uh philip rivers took last year and he took a lot of steps back but overall i feel like the positives to this is that he's going to have a much better offensive line in front of him and that's going to be really important for a guy his age that he's going to be blocked for this is the same conversation i just had with brady you know if you can block for the guy he's still going to make some pretty good throws 
And I didn't think Los Angeles offensive line did not impress me last year. And I think that's going to be a big thing that can uh, happen this year is that if they're, you know, Indianapolis still has a very good offensive line. If they're blocking for them, the big thing is that they need weapons for them to throw to. You saw what happened to Indianapolis last year when uh, T.Y. Hilton got hurt, and they haven't addressed that yet. There's still guys out there. I don't know what their cap situation is like, but there's still guys out there like a Robbie Anderson, like a Brashad Perriman. They need to bring a couple players in that can make a difference, and it's really tough to do that when you trade your 13th pick in a wide receiver-heavy draft for a guy like DeForest Buckner. So I'm kind of on the fence about it. I'm, I'm kind of right in the middle on them. I still I don't think Phillip Rivers is necessarily done. I th think he could still be productive, but he's going to need some help around him, and right now they don't have that help. I'm with you. Uh, I do think that Philip Rivers is not done. I'm not totally with you, Dewan. I don't think they have to help. I think him having an offensive line is going to do wonders play style. He doesn't move around much. And I think that if I'm Philip Rivers, I would rather have a g really good offensive line. They re-signed Anthony Costanzo, which is a big re-signing for them. I would rather have that line and maybe suspect the receivers. T.Y. Hilton will be back. Uh, so... You know, the, the receiving core isn't atrocious, definitely lower tier. But I do think that I think that Philip Rivers can actually work in Phil, in Indianapolis. I think this is a, a win from for him because he's actually in a really good situation comparatively to where he probably would have ended up going. You know, I thought he was going to end up in a broadcasting booth because I don't think anyone would want him. Clearly, I was wrong about that. <laughs> in terms of the DeForest Buckner trade, too, it's like giving up the 13th pick does hurt paying Buckner does hurt, but you're also getting a really talented player. And I think part of what the Colts have needed these past couple of years is a stud. And I think that I've criticized them for not going out and paying money to get one. I think that them finally being willing to pay money to get a guy like the Forrest Buckner, signing a guy like Philip Rivers. I think this is a win for the Colts. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely fair. I don't, I don't hate the Forrest Buckner as a player. I don't think he's the number one defensive tackle in football or anything like that, but I think he's a solid tackle and he's definitely going to be productive for that team. Um, I was just thinking in the terms of like, you know, they had an opportunity for a guy like a Henry Ruggs, CD lamb, Jerry Judy, all going to be in that range potentially that they could go get one of those guys. And I just, you know, I do think that wide receiver and tight end is going to be their biggest need right now because a lot of the players that they are missing, I do think that one injury to uh, T.Y. Hilton, and it could be game over for this team almost. I, I think Phillip Rivers is solid, but I don't think – he's not going to be able to throw to the same guys that were throwing to last year and make this team successful on offense. Yeah, that's definitely fair. That'll definitely be uh, a bit of a hindrance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, what I feel about the Colts. We can move on to the 49ers for a little bit. Uh as a loss, I don't have it as a loss. They did resign some guys. Personally, I would have kept Buckner and gotten rid of Armstead, but at the same time, they got a first round pick back. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is really about how you feel about you know DeForest Buckner compared to Eric Armstead. They're gonna have a, they're gonna have a nice draft pick next year at thirteen too. And there's going to be a lot of position players that they can make, uh, that they can get. That's is another team that I think could actually go receiver if they decide not to bring back Emmanuel Sanders, and they can get a guy like C.D. Lamb, who I think would be really fun in their offense. Um, so overall, I, I, I guess I would put it as a slight loss right now for San Francisco, just because of losing the player like Buckner. But if they can make up for it with a really good draft, I'm completely okay with the move. Yep, yeah. and then we'll move on to. A uh, team people have been talking about quite a bit, the Dallas Cowboys. They've been <laughs> busy, a lot of stuff to talk about. They lost Byron Jones. Uh, they lost Robert Quinn, Jason Witten. They signed, they re-signed Sean Lee, Amari Cooper, tagged Dak Prescott, also signed Gerald McCoy. So uh, interesting move there, I think. What are your initial thoughts on the Cowboys as a whole, you know, everything they've done? I actually, I actually put it as a win for them right now for not going absolutely insane. Um, we okay. both talked about it last week because I, I don't really think Byron Jones is a top five cornerback in the NFL. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, 
I'm just not really as high on him as some people are. And I think it's a good thing that they didn't pay him that kind of money to be the number one guy. So I'm okay with the move overall. Uh, I, did they overpay for Amari Cooper? Potentially. That is a little high. But overall, I, you know, you, you need that number one guy for Dak to throw to. And they didn't go crazy with giving Dak $40 million, $40 million a year right off the bat without improving it. So we're going to see what happens with this team. I don't think this team's a Super Bowl contender like they get talked about as. But I, I like the moves. They're solid moves. I think McCoy's going to be solid in that interior of the line. So I don't hate any of the moves they made. Yeah, I have it as a win as well. I mean, never mind the fact that Gerald McCoy is cursed, so he will not make the playoffs. So that means that they're done. <laughs> but other than that, I think that, uh, I think that, yeah, I'm with you. If the, the Mari Cooper signing, I'm not going to get concerned about giving a guy a couple million more. I feel like if he got 18 million, no one would be saying anything. Whatever. He got 20 million. I'm not going to freak out over 1% of the cap. Uh, I do think that uh, tagging Dak was huge. I think that's exactly the right move. I'm kind of with you. I feel like uh, I'm pretty much with you on all light wavelengths on this one. I know that's boring podcasting, but I think we <laughs> pretty much agree on this one. We're that yeah, same thing. I actually like the Byron Jones fit in Miami. We'll get into that in a second, but as a whole, I'm not a crazy fan of his. Uh, and yeah, I think that McCoy, he looked washed up his last year in Tampa. I think him going to Carolina kind of gave him uh, a, a, you know, a second win. And I do think yeah. that this is a good, good, definitely a good free, free agency for the Cowboys. I still for see them as like, a, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say for what we expect out of Jerry Jones, this is a very good free agency because he could have gone crazy and paid all of these guys. And I feel like that, that just would have been a disaster. They would have too much money tied up in too many small pieces rather than, you know, the actual full roster. So I felt like this was a good move overall. Yeah, myself as well. And uh, I still see them as a fringe playoff team, yeah. but they'll still be the best team in Madden. So they got that going for them. <laughs> uh, m moving on to the Buffalo Bills. Uh, their big move, obviously, they got Stephon Diggs uh, traded. I actually didn't think it was that much for him. Uh, people were going crazy about the draft capital they gave up. But I think that was just because, like, I think the DeAndre Hopkins trade just tricked everybody. Because there yeah. was also, I also saw one person tweet out something about how the Falcons gave up a second round pick for Hayden Hurst. And like, hey, you could have gotten Hopkins. It's like, no, uh, you know, you can't get a guy like Hopkins for a second round pick. Bill O'Brien's just insane. Like that doesn't yeah. typically happen. Uh, but but I like this trade from uh, for the Bills. I think that they got him. They also re-signed a couple of players, Jordan Poyer, Quentin Spain, and they signed Quentin Jefferson. So if they need somebody to jump into the stands to fight a fan, they're good there. What are your thoughts on the Bills and specifically <laughs> Stephon Diggs? Yeah, I mean, I like the trade overall. You know, the crazy thing is, is I, I'm not huge on Josh Allen as a quarterback. Um, but at this point now, you have to think that this is one of the best receiving courts in the AFC. You have John Brown, who was really productive last year. Stephon Diggs, you know, a one, I think it was the final trade was what? A one, five and six for Diggs and a seven. Is that what I saw? Or a one? It was something like that. I'll, I'll get up the exact trade in a second. I got it right go here. Ahead. Yeah, one, okay. five, and six for a, uh, in a 2021 fourth. So, I mean, you know, that's a lot of picks at the end of the day, but it's one mm. major pick. You know, I feel like if you're not trading multiple first three-round picks, then that's a win for you. You know, mm. you're getting a really productive player on a salary for a receiver that's really not that, that high. I think that's a pretty productive trade for the Bills, and him and Brown are going to be devastating. I really like... Um, What's the tight end's name? Knox that they have, and mm -hmm. um, Devin Singletary in the backfield. I think this is going to be a solid team next year. I think they're going to make some uh, make some noise out of that uh, conference. Yeah. No. Also, a side note: Devin Singletary is slow and he's short, and yet he's still good. I don't understand him, but uh, we'll <laughs> still. But in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of the Diggs trade, one thing I thought too is like those late round picks really what they're good for is to add depth. Typically they don't end up being anything special, but they'll give you some guys who can play some snaps and maybe only really play a big role if there's injuries. And the Buffalo Bills have that. They're a pretty deep team. So I think this is, yeah. you know, understanding your roster, knowing your weaknesses and your strengths and trading some of your strengths that you won't need to use to, to get uh, to up a weakness. Makes sense to me. We'll move on to Minnesota's perspective. They lost a good amount. They lost Stephon Diggs, Xavier Rhodes, Trey Waynes, and Linville Joseph. They added Michael Pierce, defensive tackle from Baltimore last year. But as a whole, I mean, 
we kind of knew it was coming, but I still feel like it has to go from a loss just because of all they lost. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed part of that. This was obviously the Vikings. Yeah, the Vikings, uh, they lost Stephon Diggs, Trey Waynes, Linville Joseph, and Xavier Rhodes, but added Michael Pierce. I said it was a loss. What do you say? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, losing Xavier Rhodes is going to be a positive addition by subtraction almost. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think Diggs is a really productive player that it's going to be really hard to find a player. You know, finding a receiver like Stephon Diggs to play in your lineup for that kind of contract is not necessarily easy to find. And I think that's going to be a tough thing to replicate. Um, I'm a little higher on Cousins than most people are. But in uh, giving him the two-year extension, too, I, I kind of like the move overall. But I do think that this team did take a step back in terms of the skill position players and the players they had at those positions. They, uh, I think I saw they franchise tag Anthony Harris, didn't, or, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I should have had that on there, but yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, I like that move. But overall, I did feel like this team did take a step back. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's a massive step back. I do think that, uh, you know, depending on how they draft, they could actually end up being a step forward. But uh, I think it sucks for Cousins, just that he kind of got there, and right when he did, the defensive, uh, but some defensive backs sort of fell off, uh, you know. But as a whole, I'll say a slight loss. And then let's move on to the Dolphins. We've mentioned them twice already on this podcast, uh, so let's just finally talk about them. They added Ted Karras. Brian Jones, Kyle Van Noy, Shaq Lawson, Eric Flowers, Jordan Howard. I mean, it's it's a laundry list of players that they've they've signed. They spent a ton of money. You said you didn't love it. Why didn't you? So basically, I'm not a huge fan of teams that try and replicate what the Patriots do because what the Patriots do is very intricate. And the other thing they don't do is they don't spend money. You know, what they do is find value in broad player one through fifty three. Uh, you know, they're trying to replicate the Patriot way, but they're doing it while spending a lot. And I, 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 I really like Van Noy, but as a $30 million guaranteed player, I don't necessarily see the value in that play. I don't love, I think I saw it was $103 million combined for Byron Jones and Xavier Howard. You know, I, you know, obviously they value the cornerback position. I think having good cornerbacks is helpful, but I don't think it's essential that you have to pay a hundred million dollars for two cornerbacks, especially when you had one of the better ones in football on one side. I don't necessarily see the point in Byron Jones being on the other side of the field for this one. So I didn't really understand that play. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I believe my I forget exactly what my video was when I made it, but it was something like I'm not. Even though Brian Byron Jones is a flaw, I think this is the perfect fit for Miami. And one of the reasons I feel that way is one of the areas where Jones really struggles is on those short range plays on like a third down and one or on a red zone situation. I brought up that last podcast. He only has two interceptions compared to 20 touchdowns. But I think this way you can have Howard who it's not like he's like insane, but he's better in those situations. He can then go over and cover a number one guy. And then you can have Jones be covering the number one guy throughout a large part of the snaps. You can use them that way. And I think this could be a very good fit for Jones. I actually, even though it's kind of going up, going against everything I usually say, I'm going to put Miami as, as a win. And one of the huge reasons I'm putting them as a win is, is because I think that they're in a position where they're not going to be competitive next year. So let's just go ahead. Let's sign some contracts. Some of them will work. Some of them won't. But you can get out of these contracts easier than a lot of people realize. I really like the Eric Flowers move as well. I thought that, you know, three years, 30 million. I think that's very reasonable. Uh, so I think this is a win. I think that this will help them in the rebuild eventually. And it'll help them get better so they can help attract free agencies, free agent players later because you know guys don't want to go to bad teams unless they're going to get more money yeah i can 100 percent agree with that counterpoint i mean I, I i do i really like brian flores as a coach and i really like him as a defensive mind and i think he's going to maximize a lot of these guys and their uh potential in their positions um but overall i just i'm not a huge fan of putting so much money into all of that especially when you don't have a quarterback, you're missing a lot of pieces on offense. We'll see what happens with this team, but I can understand, you know, you're not going anywhere. Might as well just pay somebody. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, all I have to say about that. We'll move on to the Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, it's it's kind of like they did Miami light a little bit. They did sign a couple of guys. 
They got DJ Reader for a four-year, $53 million. I think it's actually a pretty good deal. I'm a little surprised uh, someone else that was comp- – you didn't go somewhere competitive for a similar rate. Yeah. Uh, you also got Trey Waynes, who actually is getting more money per year than DJ Reader. Uh, and then they tagged AJ Green. So, uh, you know, they made some moves. Uh, they got some pieces. Hopefully this is kind of a similar thing where it can help them maybe win five or six games next year and be more competitive to try to build for the future. Oh yeah, no doubt. I um, it, it might have been a slight overpay for uh, DJ Reader for the rate of what defensive tackles are worth, but overall, I think um, I think him and Geno Atkins are going to be a really fun pairing in the middle yeah. of the defense. I think mm-hmm. that's pretty. Uh, that's actually a pretty nice compliment to one another because that run defense was really bad, and a lot of that because is because Geno Atkins isn't a very good rush defender. You know, he's very penetrating defensive tackle. He's going to get beat on some run plays. Having the guy that's a very good run defender next to him is going to be a huge play for that team. I like that move. Yeah, and I know as a Tampa Bay fan that uh, having one great defensive tackle on an otherwise terrible line back all those years when McCoy was the only guy who was, you know, worth anything on those lines, it's very easy to take one guy out of the, out of the uh, play for a defensive tackle. I'm with you on that. Uh, and again, we don't spend too much time on them. We'll move on to Cleveland. I actually love what Cleveland did Well, this offseason. I thought that, or this offseason so far, Jack Conklin is uh, a really good tackle. They needed a tackle, and they got one. Love that for them. Austin, 40 million. I think that's fine, actually. I think that getting a good receiving tight end, I know tight ends typically don't go for that much, but I think that they should. I think that they're very valuable. Keith Keenum is now good. Backup. Carl Joseph, solid safety. Watch the Schobert. But as a whole, I'm a big fan of what Cleveland did. Uh, what do you say, Kyle? Uh, I like a lot of what they did as well. I like, um, I, I mean, I, I did like the Conklin move a lot. Their tackles were a major problem for them last year. And uh, keeping Baker Mayfield upright, he had a lot of happy feet in the pocket last year, it seemed like. And hopefully this will help him with his decision making if he. Uh, you know, feel safe with a tackle on his side. That is pretty good in Jack Conklin. Um, overall, I mean, listen, I, I'm not a huge, you know, Austin Hooper as the highest paid tight end in football. I'm not necessarily sure I agree with that. But at the end of the day, that's the cost of playing free agency for a lot of teams is you're going to overpay. And if if he ends up even 800 yards, seven, eight touchdowns, you can't really complain about the value on that move. Yeah, especially with you know Kevin Stefanski. He loves to run two tight end sets, so this can give them another tight end who can use that. And you know that's the thing. You either give up draft capital by trading for a guy or you give up cap space by signing a guy in free agency. So there's always a loss. I like what they did. And then let's talk about maybe the most interesting team in football these past few years just in terms of the decisions they will make, and that is the now Las Vegas Raiders with uh, – they just – Every year, they're just making so many fun moves, I think. They, they signed Corey <laughs> Littleton, Marcus Mariota, Nick, again, I said I wasn't going to try to pronounce his last name, number 44 from the Bears, Carl Nassib, Eli Apple, Jason Witten, which is just hilarious, thinking about him in a Vegas uniform. They did lose <laughs> Carl Joseph, but as a whole, I think this is a win. I think that they, they added some pieces, maybe overspent on Carl Nassib a bit, but... I like what they did. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to pull up the full list here. But overall, I just uh, – I think the – the you know, I, a lot of these guys I feel like are a lot of people that that, um, that nobody really wants. You know, I am not very high on Eli Apple. Uh, Jason Witten's really old. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, I don't know how productive he's going to be for that team. But, I mean, I think Nassib's a pretty nice move. I think he's going to be a solid contributor at the very least. I don't think he's going to be a game changer or anything, but he'll be a solid contributor, no doubt. And, uh, you know, we'll see about Mariota. We'll see maybe if this revitalizes him a little bit in that Gruden QB camp. Um, right. You know, at the very least, it gives uh, it might give Derek Carr a little bit of push. I know you like Derek Carr. Uh, mm-hmm. It might give him a little bit of push to compete a little harder and maybe become a little bit of a better quarterback. But we'll see overall. I mean – I'm not very high on the Raiders as a whole in general in terms of football talent, but I don't hate the moves they made. Yeah, you know, I, I like, I mean, I think that they needed some defensive help. So getting Nassib, getting uh, number 44 from the Bears, getting Corey Littleton, <laughs> they have some talent now that they can build around. I also think about Mariota. 
one thing that you saw uh, Tennessee do a little bit towards the end of last season was they would have Mariota take some snaps. Uh, they would have him come in and sort of be, you know, like he was in the game during the, the Derrick Henry pass touchdown. He came in and took some snaps. Maybe the Vegas Raiders could do something sort of similar to how, you know, he could be their Taysom Hill, perhaps. So, uh, you know, there is just that option you have. I like what uh, Las Vegas has done. Uh, but but again, I think that, you know, I'm more of a fan of what they've done as a whole. I think that they're rebuilding in a very unique way, and it, it's it's fun for me. So I'll say I like it. Uh, do you have any final words on the Raiders? Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see, like, I think it would actually be really fun if they use Jacobs and Mariota in kind of a uh, a Ravens super, super light. I'm not going to say it's going to be anything compared to what the Ravens did last year on offense. But those two, mm-hmm. you know, J- Jacobs and um, Mariota can kind of replicate what they're doing over on over in Vegas. And that'd be kind of a fun offense to see if they decide to go away from Carr. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, you know, I, I'm, a fan, I'm a bigger fan of Carr than you are. I don't see any way they move on from Carr. I think that he's the, a, a very good player. I think he's, you know, top half of starting quarterback. Not everyone can be top five. I don't see any way that a guy who I don't even think is top 40 is going to take his job. I think he's a good backup. But, you know, we'll just disagree on that. And we'll move on to the another team that I'm going to make sure I don't mistake where they play. The Los Angeles Chargers. The big thing they did was they just added... Uh, Brian Bulaga. They also got Linville Joseph traded for Trey Turner and added Chris Harris. And then they of course lost Russell Okung and Phillip Rivers. I have this as a win. They got a little bit cheaper. They in- improved their line. Uh, I think Harris could help some of their young players on defense. As a whole, to me, this is a win. Yeah, I mean, I think if this team's healthy next year, this is going to be a pretty solid defense. Um mm-hmm. I, you know, Derwin James will be back, obviously. Chris Harris, I still think it, you know, did he take a step back last year? Yeah, sure. But is he still a solid contributor? I definitely think so. I think he could be a solid player on any team. So I don't hate the move. Um, I think this defense is going to be solid next year. I think that they, the the issue I saw with the Chargers is obviously they, I think they targeted some quarterbacks in free agency and they struck out. So it's kind of going to be, what are they going to do next? I think this is a perf- This is going to be the Justin Herbert landing spot. I'm not really high on Herbert unless someone trades up and tries to poach him. Um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of Herbert, but overall that's going to be the guy they're going to get at six, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, you know, I, I think Bulaga is a really significant player, and I actually had the Packers as one of my... Uh, I actually had the Packers as one of my biggest losers for losing Bulaga. Um, if he can stay healthy, that's a solid contributor on an offensive line that hasn't been very good, so I like that move. Yeah, I do as well. And let's just go straight into the Packers then. Uh, they lost Brian Bulaga. They lost Blake Martinez, Kyler, Kyler Fackrell, Jimmy Graham. They did get Christian Kirksey. But yeah, I'm with you. They lost a good amount. And I feel like Kirksey was, is an upgrade from Martinez. I don't see him as like this game changer. And uh, I mean, losing Jimmy Graham, whatever. But uh, losing Brian Bulaga especially. I mean, tackles are so hard to find in the NFL. Losing one free agency is tough. Yeah, and I mean, we we all saw the numbers with Rodgers last year, especially the quarterback rating numbers. I, I forgot. I saw it somewhere. I forgot to write it down. Uh, the quarterback rating numbers for Rodgers last year without Bulaga was a significant step back. And, you know, I'm not going to say Aaron Rodgers is bad without Brian Bulaga, but having that player on that side of the ball is just so important that the, letting him go for no reason just doesn't make sense to me. No, Aaron Rodgers is terrible because the GOAT Tom Brady <laughs> – Way better. I have to be a Tom Brady fan now, so I have to. It's I mean, a, you got it pretty much down. I can give you a few pointers on uh, off air. Okay, great. <laughs> off camera, we can talk about how I can who can get my full Tom Brady stand on. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm with you with the Packers. I think they'll be fine, but losing a tackle hurts. Uh, and then let's go on to a team that lost a bunch, and not just in the regular season, but also in the in the off season. And that is the Jacksonville Jaguars. They lost. A.J. Boye was a little bit ago, but it was still kind of free agency. Calais Campbell, Nick Foles. So they lost some guys, but cleared up a ton of cap space. They signed Joe Schobert. They tied Yannick Ngakwe, signed Dequise Denard, who's kind of a whatever. But as a whole, I think that this is, I actually have this as a win. 
And I know they lost a ton of talent, but I think they're in a clear re rebuild. They're trying to get better. I think getting rid of the Nick Foles trade, getting rid of the Nick Foles contract really helps them. I think that AJ Boyo and Campbell, uh, you know, maybe I would have liked to see them get more giraffe capital back, but as a whole, just getting rid of the contracts, they're in a position where they can get younger and get better heading into the near future. Yeah, I mean, this team's going to have an opportunity to spend now over the next couple seasons. It just depends on if they actually decide to uh, use some of that money or that capital to towards free agency or improving the roster. You know, I do think this team kind of needed a this team needed a refresh after the Jalen Ramsey situation, after everything that happened over these past couple of years. I think this team needed a reboot, and I think this is the right direction for them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we'll just uh, move on. We'll try to plow ahead here. We still got about seven teams left, six teams left. So uh, the Tennessee Titans now, the team that uh, they also got rid, made a I think a qu more a questionable move than the Campbell trade, I think, which was getting rid of Javel Casey, who a really good player. I didn't really understand that one. They also signed Vic Beasley to a one year, nine point five million dollar contract. Another one I don't totally understand it's one year so it's not that big of a risk but i would have yeah. rather just kept casey they did resign henry and Tannehill, or you know they tagged henry resigned Tannehill. can't understate how important that is but also they lost jack conklin and lost mariota who as we both agreed is at least a very good backup quarterback so uh as a whole this is a definite loss for me even though they did resign their two most important players to resign yeah i mean this is this is a loss for me that can turn into a win if they uh, they, if they add the right pieces in the draft. I, I think they're trying to get a little bit younger, a little bit um, a little bit a little less money. Obviously, you know they were benefiting off the fact that they didn't really have to pay their quarterback or running back up until this off season. So they got to find value. They're going to have to get a tackle in the draft, and if they can find good value, I think they're twenty fourth this year, if I remember correctly, um, or twenty second in the draft, something like um, that. Yeah, so if they can get if they can get a solid tackle at that position, that'll make a, that'll be a pretty good uh, add. Um, it just seemed like the uh, you know letting go Casey. I didn't really agree with it either. I'm with you. Uh, I think Vic Beasley is a kind of let's see what happens here uh, kind of move, but I think he still can be a pretty solid pass rusher if he can stay healthy. Yeah, maybe. I mean, he was definitely on a terrible contract in Atlanta, so you know Atlanta fans are are rejoicing as of right now. Uh, according to this site, it says that they're 29th, but I guess that's if because they made the AFC Championship game. Uh, I don't know if that's how it worked. That's what this site says. Uh, oh, ESPN. Wow. I, I, tr I trust them. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was only you make the Super Bowl to get it like that. I guess I'm wrong. But uh, anyways, shows how little I know about how making the playoffs affects your, your draft order. Your I don't draft know position, anything about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, they're going to have yeah, to add I mean, a tackle. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I, losing Jack Conklin, it just it hurts, and I think Casey hurts. Uh, I, I would have rather seen them try to keep one of them on and not do the Beasley thing, uh, uh, but whatever. Uh, moving on to the Giants. Giants did made a few interesting moves here. They signed Kyler Fackrell and Blake Martinez, so getting some former Packers, and also James Bradbury, who, as I talked about a little bit earlier with the Panthers, he's one of the real underrated cornerbacks in the NFL. He's a big guy who can cover big guys. And as a Buccaneers fan, I am very happy that Mike Evans won't have two games where he has very little amount of yards every season uh, <laughs> going up against Bradbury because he had Evans' number, and I'm happy he's out of the division. Yeah, I mean, I like the move, especially because, you know— it Outside of Phil, you know, in that division too, there's some pretty solid number one receivers. Um, you know, I thought McLaurin uh, out of uh, Washington was pretty good last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amari Cooper, obviously, that's going to be a big cover too. So I think that's some pretty solid moves. You know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of receivers. That's four games of those two guys that you're going to need the number one guy to cover. And obviously, you know, they got out of the Janoris Jenkins move, which was a good thing. And then they bring in a pretty good cornerback this year to replace him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, let's go to the team that Janoris Jenkins went to. They signed Malcolm Jenkins, the New Orleans Saints did. They also did lose Eli Apple and Teddy Bridgewater. But, you know, I mean, uh, adding Malcolm Jenkins, I love the move. Uh, I, I made a video about it. I think that he's one of the smartest players on defense in the NFL, especially with Tom Brady now coming to the division. I think he could help try to counteract 
that just by having a high IQ player on the other side of the ball. This is a big win for me just because of the Malcolm Jenkins thing. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I really actually like that move. Jenkins is a high IQ safety. He's going to step in there and make a lot of smart plays for that team. And I, I think that's a good move overall. That secondary is really good. I think that Saints team is going to be pretty good again next year. Obviously, we'll see what uh, how Drew Brees' arm holds up throughout the year. He kind of regre- regressed at the end of the year. Um, but overall, I didn't hate the move. And uh, I really like Jenkins on that defense. Yeah, and I'll actually even fight back on the he progressed at the end of the year. I think that's a popular narrative, but I think it was really mostly because of his bad playoff performance. Yeah, I mean, overall, I just feel like the playoffs is where you have to get it done. And overall, his uh, his ability, it just seemed like his ability to throw the ball downfield just wasn't there in that game. Obviously, that Vikings defense is really good, and that made a huge difference. But I just feel like he was lacking that at the end of the season for the, against that in that playoff game. No, that's not that's not unfair. I mean, he's never been the best deep ball thrower just in general. What makes him great is just his accuracy. Uh, and, you know, he, I mean, he was the original check down master where he was the first. I feel like he was one of the first guys who said, I'm just going to check down like, you know, five, six times in a drive if I have to. Let's do that. Uh, his, you know, touchdown to interception ratio last year was 27 touchdowns to four interceptions. So he's kind of turned into like this elite game manager type in a sense. I'm still high on Breeze. Uh, I think the Breeze can still play well. I hope you're right because I would love for the Bucks to do something this season, but that'll probably never happen. So uh, we'll see what happens. But let's move on to another team in that NFC South, the Atlanta Falcons. They added Dante Fowler Jr., traded for Hayden Hurst, gave up a second round pick, lost Beasley, which is a huge plus for them. It did lose Hooper, but you know they got Hurst back, who's only a slight downgrade. I have it as a loss because they lost the number two pick as well, but it's a slight loss. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, that's fine with me. Obviously, like you said, the Beasley move is, you know, going to be a positive for them that they're out of that contract. I I actually do like Hurst in that team. I think they're going to be just fine on offense. Um, As long as they get the ball to Julio Jones in the red zone, I think they'll be just fine. Um, Yeah. You know, I, I actually think this is a team that can kind of bounce back and have a pretty decent year next year, especially with the Panthers. Kind of, in my mind, the Panthers are regressing next year. And I I do think this team can be solid next year. I think this is a team that might be a little bit competitive. Yeah, they really are just such a wild card. Who really knows? But we don't have to spend too, too long talking about them. Let's move on, and let's move on to Denver. What are your thoughts on the Denver Broncos? I think I said earlier, you know, Chris... Chris Harris is not I don't he took a step back last year but I think he's a solid contributor but I think AJ Bouye is going to be a better contributor. I think this team's going to I think this is another team that made some solid moves and I'm with you that was a win. I think I had it down here as a B overall if I gave it a grade. Yeah. So I I like the moves overall. I think that's a nice uh nice play there for the Broncos. All right. We'll move on to the last team. That is the Baltimore Ravens. They added Michael Brockers, who has had some good years in L.A., but or he had the good years in San Diego. His years in L.A. have kind of been a little bit disappointing. But they also had uh, added Calais Campbell, which I think is a good move in the short term. And uh, they lost Michael Pierce, but they got Campbell back, which is an upgrade, for, in my opinion. And they, of course, lost Hayden Hurst, but they got a second-round pick back for that. So for me, this is a win. Yeah, I actually had this one as like a slight loss for me. I think the the value they got for Hurst was nice, especially when he kind of was the number two tight end to Andrews anyway. So that's a nice mm-hmm. pick. Um, I'm not really crazy about the Campbell deal, as a lot of people are going nuts about. You know, they really overpaid for a guy who's 33 years old, and they're going to pay him a lot these next couple of years. I really thought with the, the cap space they had, you know, you're, you're maximizing your opportunity right now as having essentially – the franchise quarterback on a rookie deal is the best time to build your roster and build a lot of talent around them. And I thought this was a team that really should have addressed a lot of the receiver position and that kind of thing, because I think Hollywood Brown's solid, but I don't think he's ready to be the number one guy. I think if they really went out and got a guy that could have been that number one option for Lamar Jackson, I feel like that would have been a really big move for them. And they didn't really go out and get that guy. And I don't know how long Mark Ingram's legs are going to hold up as a running back. I feel like, to me, this was a slight loss that they could have done so much more with that skill position talent. Yeah, see, I don't know if I totally agree, just because I think that this is not the team that 
needs those skill position players. I, I mean, they had a historic offense last year. It was one of the best offenses we've ever seen. I'm fine with their offense. I say let's improve the defense. Let's get some guys who can stop the run because that hurt them last year against Tennessee. And I think this is, uh, I don't think they, I get, I get what you're saying. It's possible they could have done more. I didn't really view it from that sense. I've simply viewed these as, did they get better or worse? And to me, they got better. Yeah, I mean, we're going to see what happens with that team. Like you said, Brockers has some good years and some bad years. And I think uh, Campbell is going to be a solid player next year. I don't think he's going to be a great player, though. And he's going to get paid a lot for these next two years. And we're going to see how long he holds up. That's my opinion on that one. And, you know, if you're worried about, to me, at least in my perspective, if you're worried about beating the Tennessee Titans, then you're not going to win a Super Bowl. I think this team should be worried about playing the Kansas City Chiefs and building a team that's going to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. And I think if they had a guy that they can go get the ball to when it matters the most, I think that's going to be a huge step for them. And I think they missed the opportunity to go and get some guys. Uh, I mean, when I say sort of the fact that what they did, what they had, you know, their negatives that they had caused them to lose the Titans, it's more so they had a matchup problem that allowed them to get defeated. And that's the problem with, football is you can't have a matchup problem against a certain team because all you need to do is lose once and you're done. So I think that, I think that adding someone like Campbell who does help a weakness, I think will help them. And again, like, yeah, you're right. There's a chance that they could, that that's contract could suck. Absolutely. You can't argue it, but at the same time, there's a chance that he could continue to be Calais Campbell. And now you got a really good defensive tackle for a fifth round pick. Uh, I just think it's the correct move. At the end of the day, cap space is one thing, but I mean, who out there would have been a better signing than Cam? But you know, who would have who would have been better to spend the money on? Yeah, I just thought they should have went skill position with some of the guys. That's fair. I think overall at the defensive tackle position, if you're going to get a guy at the value of Calais Campbell, that's definitely you know the right move to make. I I feel like there's guys out there that they could have gotten, such as you know make a run at a guy like an Amari Cooper or someone like that to try and make some, uh, you know, get that player to be the Ravens' number one guy. I feel like that would have been a nice move as well. But they, uh, you know, that improving that run defense is going to be important for them going forward. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and uh, again, I'll just disagree and uh, we don't spend too much time on this, but I do think that, I think that they're better off where they are now than paying someone like Amari Cooper, even if he took a discount to go there, even him on 18 million, I think I would rather have them where they're at now, pay Campbell and still have some money left over. And now to have that extra second round pick, they can get more players through the draft, you know, deep wide receiver draft. Maybe they can add somebody that way. Uh, And, you know, the real reason they lost, honestly, the real reason they lost to the Titans last year was because they didn't convert on fourth downs. I mean, uh, those two fourth downs really hurt them. It's a different game if they convert them, which they did all season long. Uh, and again, I'm not saying this is like a slam dunk. Ravens did great, you know, ultimate winners. But I see this as a slight upside, but I do see where you're coming from. There probably were better ways to do it, especially when you have so much talent that teams are going to want to play for you. Oh, yeah. Or no players. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously, you know, they can get a good receiver in the draft. You know, there's still an opportunity for them to get a guy like Emmanuel Sanders that's going to be a contributor on that offense. There's still positions that they can actually, you know, I actually really like if, like, J.K. Dobbins went to that team. I think that's a really good move, too. You know, there's a lot of players that they can get that that would be really good value in the draft that I think would end up turning this into a win. I just feel like this would, you know, I'm very much of, you know, if you have an opportunity to win a Super Bowl, go win a Super Bowl. You know, mm-hmm. and I think that the opportunity was now for the Ravens to make some moves, and I haven't seen them yet. I still think they can come. So there's still opportunities for them to be really good this next season again. Yeah. And listen, you know, you and I definitely agree on that point. I love the Kawhi Leonard trade back when that happened, which is the ultimate let's go try to win a championship move. Yeah. Same reason why I like the Brady move because it's, hey, let's go try something. Let's try to win it all. If it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. At the end of the day, there are 31 losers and one winner. So, yeah, I mean, that's everything I had. Uh, I meant to say this at the top of the show. I'll probably put an edit in to make sure I get it. But we didn't talk about the Jets, Chiefs, Steelers, Redskins, Rams, or Seahawks just because they're boring. They haven't really done much. So uh, we kind of just skipped over those. But that's uh, my thoughts. It's your thoughts. 
any final thoughts yep. as a whole for the free agency? Yeah, I mean, you listed those teams. We're obviously going to see Jadavian Clowney, still the biggest name, still available. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of reports are saying that he's not kind of getting the market that he was expecting. Um, you know, maybe he'll take a slight... It'd be interesting to see what happens if he's not getting the market he's expecting, if he gets another, like, one-year prove-it deal, or if someone eventually just caves and overpays him. That's going to be interesting to see. The other one that I thought was really interesting was uh, the Chris Jones franchise tag. Um, Mm -hmm. We talked about it a little bit on the last podcast during our draft session. Um, It's going to be interesting to see if, A, they can give him a long-term contract, and if, B, if not, what his value is going to be on the trade market if they decide that trading him is going to be the best option, which I have seen a lot of Chiefs fans talk about because he hasn't committed to a long-term deal. Yeah, no, that's a, a very interesting point. I think uh, you could also say the same thing about Shaq Barrett. Uh, there's s- similar interesting stuff. I think that we'll have to to wait and see. I mean, I think that at a certain point, the Chiefs will end up with a deal with Jones. But but yeah, we'll see. Uh, that's our podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, and Kyle, thanks for coming on. And of course, as always, for everyone out there, thanks for watching or listening. Yep. Enjoy quarantine.